God's going to show us the picture of our destiny, okay? The full picture of our destiny. Right now we see in part, and then the picture is just uh, a sculpture that's only partially completed, and it's there for a reason, because we don't see the full destiny that we have. But it says in the Bible that when we, when he appears, we will see him as he is and we'll be like him. You know that verse? It's right there. It's 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. So can you just close your eyes with me and let's just pray. Lord, we want this to be true about ourselves today. Not next week, not a month from now, but would you plant a seed? Would you spark a fire inside of us that when we see you, when you appear, you appear today. You were with us this morning. And when you, were, you appear, we see you as you are. And as we see you, we become more like you. Not just when we die. Not just when you return on your second coming and your final return, but right now in this life, as you appear to us and you make yourself real to us, we see you for who you really are and we become like you. That sounds like a really high bar, but that's who you are. You set the bar high for us and we want nothing less than everything that you have for us. Can you say that? I want nothing less than everything the Lord has for me. Amen. He's a good father and he has good things for you. <laughs> All right. This is the, the uh, voice version of 1 John chapter 3. It says, my loved ones, we've been adopted into God's family and we are officially his children now. If you didn't know that, that's really good news. Okay. The spirit of adoption cries out, Abba, Father. Release that over us. Release it over the region, over the world, Lord. The, the orphan spirit of the devil is trying to rise up. We say no. Release that spirit of adoption that we could cry, Abba, Father. And this is the text verse. The full picture of our destiny is not yet clear. But we know this much. When Jesus appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. I don't know if this ever happens to you when you're reading a verse and you go back and read it again and read it again and then you wake up the next day and that's the verse that's on your mind again. Isn't that great when that happens? It's like God is highlighting it for you and, and reminding you there's probably more there than you've seen before, right? So that's what happened to me. We'll see him just as he is. And for some people, he appeared today, right? That doesn't mean he only appears here. He wants to be with us. He loves to be with us. We have to welcome him, though, right? We have to make him welcome, create a landing strip in our life. So this is not just when he comes back. Yes, he's going to return, final return. It's going to be amazing. Can't wait. But, you know, occupy until he comes. We're officially his children and the full picture of our destiny. That's important. Those two things are tied together. A child wants to know their destiny from their father and their mother. That's how we get it. We know this much when he appears, we'll be like him, and we'll see him just as he is. So we have a saying here. Most of us know that we're human beings, but we teach something called performance orientation in the class on inner healing, and performance orientation is a negative thing because it means that you believe a lie that you're only going to be loved if you perform well. So instead of being a human being, you're a human doing. <laughs> it doesn't have the same ring, does it? I don't want to be a human doing. I want to be a human being. I want to be a child of God. I don't, want, I don't want my title to be my identity because if somebody takes my title away, I don't want to lose my identity. So tell us about yourself. I'm an accountant. Well, okay, that's your job, but that's not your identity, I hope. <laughs> I'm not an accountant either, by the way, so I'm not trying to make fun of anybody, but who, who am I? That's what Jesus said to Peter. First he says, well, who do they say I am? And then, who do you say I am, Peter? And then I said, I don't know, last week or the week before, what if Jesus had said to Peter, who do you think I think you are, Peter? That's a really important one, too. Like, how do we see God seeing us? What's that identity? Because a lot of times, the way we think it, it's not what he thinks about us. He thinks a lot more highly of us than we even think about ourselves. And we need to be reminded of that. So are we human beings? You know, so it goes from who am I to who are we? And, and I would say, I would rather us think about it this way. We're humans becoming. All right? We're on a journey to go someplace. And it's not just to get to heaven when we die. 
And it's, it's not hoping, well, I, I didn't sin too bad this week, so he'll forgive me and I'll get into heaven when I die. Again, I want to go to heaven when I die, don't you? <laughs> but what about here? What about the rest of our life here? I hope I have a real long time left because I love serving the Lord. I love trying to help other people to know him and, and every other way that he tries to use us. We're here for a reason, to be a light in darkness and to be a light in light, you know, to help other people grow. Know him and then make him known. That's not my line. That's a great line, isn't it? So what am I becoming? And that's, you know, the verse I, I already read. And what are we becoming together as a tribe? Best word I know is kingdom, right? That's the best word I know. We're, we're operating in God's kingdom in an earthly realm. The world could reject his kingdom. We accept his kingdom and operate in it. And that is, that's the decision-making process that we use. And, and I have another graph in here that will help you see it in, in a little bit. But I'm going to keep going. Who do men say that I, the son of man, am? You know this portion. Then he said to Peter, who do you say that I am? Actually, to all of them. And Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And not too far away from that, in John's version of it, it says many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So Peter has this amazing revelation. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter's a fisherman. He's not real educated in the things of God. And yet, if you fast forward to the book of Acts, these men are not drunk, as you suppose. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. Remember this? Anybody here Pentecostal? That's like a big, famous verse in the Pentecostal church. Acts chapter 2, right? <laughs> They're not drunk, as you suppose. This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days. Anybody know it? You can look that one up. Many of his disciples went back and walked no more. And Jesus said to the twelve, do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Look around today. What are the options? You have the words of eternal life. And we've come to believe and know. Believe and know. We have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So the people who walked away didn't believe and know. And whatever they were being forced to do by the culture could have overridden that belief and that knowledge, but it's never too late. Right? We, we all could probably identify times, even in the recent past, where we didn't fully measure up to what God would have expected from us. But he doesn't condemn us. When you fall short, he doesn't condemn us. He lets us get up and retake the quiz. Anybody ever fail a quiz by the Lord? And the way you behaved, the way you acted, instead of getting an A+, plus, you might have got a C-. minus. I call that a tuition payment in the college of life. <laughs> Right? It, there's a cost, man. There's a cost. There's some relational cost. Something happened that you may, you know, it costs you something. And then Titus. Oh, man. Paul writes this letter to Titus. It's a power-packed little, little epistle. And it says, we were slaves to sensual cravings and pleasures. Please raise your hand. Before you were, before you were born again and, and Jesus wasn't on the throne of your heart, you gave in to your flesh one way or another. I don't need to know your past. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So if we didn't know the truth, we were following whatever the culture said to do. And that's what this is. We were slaves to sensual cravings and pleasures, spent our lives being spiteful and envious, hated by many, and hating one another. Well, you're saying, well, Pastor, you can't say that about me. I've never been hated by anyone. We're in New Jersey, man. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe in Oklahoma that might be true, but I, get, I was getting hated on the ride to work in the morning, and they didn't even know me. Just by changing lanes, I was getting the one-finger salute from people. But then something happened. <laughs> oh, then something happened. God, our Savior, and his overpowering love and kindness for humankind entered our world. While we were wasting our lives in sin, this is Romans now, God revealed his powerful love to us in a tangible display. The anointed one died for us. Here's the if statement is so amazing, right? If we were in the heat of combat with God when his son came and we just had communion for the joy that was set before him. That was when we were enemies. We were openly battling. My mother was the one witnessing to me. I was, I was mocking her, openly mocking her that she was a Jesus freak. And what happened to you? 
I had an aunt after I got saved say, I like the old Peter that used to get high. Can you imagine? I forgave her. I gave her my Bible, actually. And uh, she's with the Lord now, in Jesus' name. Uh, if we were in the heat of combat with God, when his son came and reconciled us by laying down his life, we couldn't have been in worse shape than to try to earn, like, please, we're trying really hard down here, can't you help us? It was like completely no, no recognition. He made the world, and yet the people that he made rejected him. His own people rejected him, but it didn't stop him because he was faithful to his father. Remember this in Galatians 2.20? I am crucified with Christ, say it. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faithfulness. I'm just trying to plant that seed. I live by the faithfulness of the Son of God. He's my example. I'm crucified with him. That old Peter Roselli died, and now I've been resurrected. But guess what? The old Peter can resurrect too. Careful. Careful. You know what I'm saying is true. So just be careful. Who is sitting on the throne of your heart? Yes, you're a new creation, but you've got to mature. You've got to grow. Another day's topic. So he laid down his life while we were his enemies. How much more will we be saved now that he's resurrected and that spirit that raised him from the dead is now alive in you and I if you're a Christian? And it's got to be because if you accept the Lord, it says you cannot say yes to the Lord unless it's by the Holy Spirit. So he's in there. Maybe we just have to cultivate the relationship with him to a higher degree and a higher level and say, Lord, you have my true identity. Who do you want me to be? The full picture of my destiny is not yet clear, but I know that when you appear, I'm going to be like, more like you. So if that was your goal every day when you woke up to say, I want to be more like you today than I was yesterday and more like you tomorrow than I am today. Just like Stevie Wonder saying, remember that one? I love you more today than yesterday, but not as much as tomorrow. If he could say that about a girl, we could say that about God. And God says it about you. So I don't know about you, but like for me, this is how it can feel sometimes <laughs> about what does my destiny look like. Some kind of crazy formula, and there's nine billion options that could be out there, and I still have to drive this thing forward. Like, where am I going? And what I've called it is a changing cultural algorithm for how valuable you are. And I'll just say it for a minute here. The world values you based on the latest trend and how well you go along with their storyline, their narrative, and it keeps changing. That, that's crazy. God never changes. The truth of the word never changes. You can't keep following a compass that keeps moving. North keeps changing, but the world doesn't know this because at, at the deepest level, we want community and we want to be accepted by people. So this is just a plan of the enemy that if, if I have to base my value on an algorithm of the world that keeps on changing, I'm never going to know who I am. And if they can confuse us about the most basic principle of boy and girl, then they can get anything else in the downline behind that. That's the most secure thing we have is he made them male and female in the garden. In his image, male and female. We're made in his image. And I'm sympathetic to people who who are confused about that and have a problem. We want to help everybody, but you, you don't get to change the truth. Okay, that's one version, or I can have my kingdom aspiration. You know what aspiration, it's, it's a nice way of saying striving, in my opinion, because striving has this negative side to it that, that it blinds us to try to be greedy almost, but an aspiration is my goal. It's what I'm aspiring for. And sometimes you have to like loosen your grip a little because the harder you try, the less you're going to be able to be that jazz player, right? The jazz player has to be able to improvise. And, and you don't try harder to improvise. You relax to improvise. It's not easy. So I don't want my goal to be to have to conform to the latest narrative of the culture. I've got a truth compass pointing towards the word of God. I want to conform to God's perfect will. Now, every one of you, has God's perfect will for your life. 
Your identity is different than mine. We're Christians, but he loves us so much that he gives each one of us a customized plan for how we can completely come into flourishing in the kingdom. And we started calling it years ago, what makes your heart sing? If you had an unexpected day off and you could spend it any way you want, what would you do? What's the thing that you love to do the most that you wish you could do it all the time, but life and bills and everything else comes along? What makes your heart sing? When do you come most alive? If you have children, wouldn't you want them to find that? Wouldn't that be your goal? If you love those children, what if they woke up every day and instead of saying, I hate my job, they say, oh my God, I can't wait to get there because I'm going to change lives today. What a gift that would be. Did anybody have that when you were growing up? Amazing. See? One hand. Amazing. But we, we didn't, I'm not blaming my parents. They didn't know. They had to survive. They lived through the Depression. They didn't know about this. You just work. You work hard. You pay your bills. You show up. But, you know, like, wow, we, we really can be intentional about helping them find the thing that's going to cause them to flourish. I got news for you. That's our job here is to help you find the thing that you're going to flourish in and to remove any obstacles that would stop you from getting there. And we have to do that by engaging with each other. And I don't have much longer to go here. God didn't send his son into the world to judge it. Instead, he's here to rescue a world headed towards certain destruction. Psalm 32 says, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. One of the things about cancel culture is there's no forgiveness. It's really a big problem. And because the rules keep changing, something that you did 30 years ago that was okay and accepted at the time is now considered no good. And you're being judged today by something you did 30 years ago that was a cultural norm. That's not forgiveness. You didn't do it with any bad intentions. And I'm only touching very lightly on this. It's much deeper. And then in Proverbs 28, it says, whoever confesses his sins will find mercy. And that's not exactly a common thing in the culture today either, is if you make a mistake, if you say a wrong thing, if you tweet the wrong thing and you get canceled, there's no forgiveness and there's no mercy. And people forget that they're going to make a mistake someday too. And as you give mercy is how you're going to receive it. As you give forgiveness, that's how it comes back to you. I'm just quoting Matthew 7 right there. Almost done. Titus 3, he came to save us. It's not good. I'm sorry. It's not that we earned it by doing good works or righteous deeds. He came because he's merciful. He brought us out of our old ways of living to a new beginning through the washing of regeneration. We can actually stand now because this is, this is worth just really like meditating on and let's just do a prophetic act of holding our arms up for the washing of regeneration that the Lord gives us. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So many people have given a testimony that when they got saved, they felt like a weight was taken off their shoulders. Is that anybody here? They felt like they were under a godly shower and they were being cleansed from all the defilement of the world. That's what this is. Through the washing of regeneration, a new seed gets planted in our hearts of life from God, from God's kingdom. And it's like, this is who you were always meant to be. He made us completely new through the Holy Spirit who was poured out in abundance through Jesus, the anointed, our Savior. Not because we earned it, but by grace. You know this. You've been saved. You receive it through faith. It was not our plan or our effort. It's God's gift, pure and simple. Come on, say it. I didn't earn it. No, one of us did. Not one of us did. So don't go around bragging that you must have done something amazing, all right? You don't have to say that part. But there's something very humbling about being a Christian and being filled with the Holy Spirit. There's always another lesson to be learned. And I would rather pay the tuition payment to the Lord than the world teaching me what, what their way of doing things is. Because there's no redemption in that. And there's only going to be redemption in the Lord. And it doesn't mean that some people don't live lives and never really find God's identity. They do. They live their lives. But it's going to fall short of what he wanted for you. And we should fight that. And say, no, I'm not going to accept less than what the Lord has for me. And what we should be doing as we gather together is calling out what we see in each other. The redemptive side. Because half the time, we might see it, but you don't believe what we're saying. Somebody spoke word curses over you when you were growing up. Somebody kept speaking down at you. There was some kind of root system in your family line, some generational curse. And, and the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the whole earth 
to show himself strong on the people whose heart will be loyal to, to him. And, and he wants to reveal what those roots are. We don't have all the answers. Nobody does. But we have the one who has the answers. And we've seen miracle after miracle of people getting healed and transformed and changed. It can't be any other way but by the supernatural power of God. Nothing I can do. I didn't do anything amazing except be obedient to what he said. And then can we just press into this one right here? We are the product of his hand, heaven's poetry etched on lives. That's that word poema. Workmanship is the way it says it in the New King James. But I like it as heaven's poetry. Can you lift your hands and accept that identity? Can you accept the identity that you are heaven's poetry? And that God had a plan for your life. And regardless of the, of the problems that you've had in the past, those things are in the rearview mirror. You look through the windshield now and you move forward with him. And you accept the truth of the word of God that you are the poetry of God etched on a human being. And you know what? The clock is ticking. It doesn't matter if you're 10 or 12 or 20 or 80. We've got a certain amount of time here. And the longer he can rob from you and keep making you think you're a loser and you're nothing and that you're not poetry, then you're believing a lie. And how many know it's not good to believe lies? So, Lord, help us to know the truth about what our true identity, it hasn't yet been fully revealed, but would you pull back another layer and show us at a deeper level who we are called to be? Because we want to live in the fullness of who you've called us to be, not a counterfeit version of our true identity. And it's all around us people confused about this lord so as we find it let us be a, a lighthouse for other people that can come to the truth of your word about who they are we're created in the anointed jesus to accomplish the good works god arranged long ago so as you lift your hand just want to speak this over you okay that this is true for you today if you're watching on tv uh, on the internet. It's true for you today. You were created in Christ to accomplish the good works of your life arranged long ago. Do you ever notice when somebody's really good at something, it doesn't look like they're working? <laughs> and then you try to do that thing and that's not really your wheelhouse and it takes you 10 hours and it took them like 20 minutes? Like this is what he wants us to do. He wants us to find that exact place where where we're going to flourish in the things we do and be so fruit-filled, right? He said, I want fruit that remains. And if you find what you were created to be, you're going to produce just baskets and baskets of fruit. So I speak that over your people today, Lord. I thank you that you met us here today. Just like the prophetic word said that there was a guest speaker here today and you were the guest that was welcomed in the house. We're humbled by that, Lord. We're humbled by how much you want to be with us. So help us to remove obstacles and barriers that stop us from living in that place 24 seven with you. To recognize that you're not an angry God wanting to punish us. You're a loving father that wants us to flourish. And we receive this word today, Lord, that our identity is poetry. That we are the poetry of heaven written on beating hearts of living people and that we become alive as to who you called us to be. It's the most beautiful treasure because we're in your perfect will. Help us, Lord, not to live by the, by the value algorithm of this world, but to find our value as a child of God. Sons and daughters of a living God who loves us, cares, us, cares for us, and wants us to flourish. In Jesus' name, amen.